when we speak about climate change, then we very often have in mind that the world will be warmer, two or three degrees in the future. But what does it mean really in detail? So this figure shows you summer temperatures in Germany over the last hundred something years. And you see the straight line, it shows already that the summer temperatures are increasing. Some years are warmer, some are lower, but it's increasing. If you have a look then on the last 20 years, you clearly see that all the summers were warmer summers. In particular, the summer 2003 and 2018 were then pretty hot, pretty dry, and on the mean, these were two degrees years. So this is the world we expect if we go to a three or two degree world. So how can we adapt to this new world? And I think that models are pretty valuable tools to help with projections and pictures of the future. So first of all, we need climate models. So climate models in the past were pretty coarse, but they are getting to higher and higher resolutions, and they will reach this one kilometer resolution pretty soon, I think. The next thing we need is impact models, modeling hydrology, vegetation, etc. Now, the problem with the impact models is that traditionally they focus on specific areas like catchments, for example, in hydrology. And the models are not made such that you can easily transfer these models to other regions in the world. And why is this? It's the heterogeneity at our land surface. So imagine you would like to establish a model for Europe in a one kilometer grid resolution. That means you have to establish a model with 10 million grid cells. And these grid cells need properties, parameters, and there's a lot, there's different processes, etc. So at least you need 100 millions of parameters. So this is a very, very huge task to find the best 100 million parameters for such a model. So it's in the end a, a huge data science task. And now comes the central slide, so to say, of this talk, because we investigated a method I think that can be key to solve exactly that problem. So how does that work? So we start with a very small scale where we have a lot of information usually available like soil composition or digital elevation models or, um, uh, or vegetation uh, maps. The problem is now that these information is not the information we really need sometimes in the models. What we need is parameters, like for example porosity. And that is a property that gives you the amount of water that fits into the soil. So we came up then with the idea to link these two, the information we have and the information we need with a function, using data science approaches. And that means then in the end you're looking for functions and some free parameters in these functions and these are not 100 millions of parameters anymore. These are two, three, four. You have more parameters then, but you never have then 100 million free degrees of freedom anymore. You have 50, 60, and this task you can solve with the computers easily. So this is the first step, and then we have the parameters on this very fine scale, usually 10 meter, 20 meter, or 50 meters. And this is not the scale where we usually uh, then run the model because it's computationally too expensive. So we have to translate also the model to the modeling scale of a kilometer grid, for example. And here comes then theoretical physics with all this beauty of scaling operators into play. And we can establish these scaling operators and could translate the parameters to these coarser scales. It preserves physics, and you also see it pre pre preserves all these uh, patterns on this parameter uh, porosity. So the end, in the end, we have seamless parameter fields working across the different scales. And this method we took and implemented the method on a hydrological model, our MHM uh, at the U of Z. And uh, we, we could um, um, implement that at the one kilometer grid cell. And then what you see here now on the, on the left hand side is the model running for whole Europe in a very high resolution producing, for example, stream flow information. So the reddish uh, parts are high stream flow areas and the bluest one uh, are lower ones. 
And then we could also combine this model with climate projections, different climate models, different RCPs, and we could do extensive uncertainty quantification. And in the end, we ended up then with a huge amount of data. Similar, likely we have heard that already in the remote sensing talk of Richard Bamler. So taking that big information amount, we then uh, have to uh, address the challenge that we need to extract the information we need out of this huge amount of data. And coming back to 2018, uh, for example, we were suffering under droughts. So we can, for example, extract such a map. This is a projection for 2,100. It's a three-degree scenario. And what you see here is the number of months we probably then will suffer under droughts. And if you concentrate uh, on the central part here in Europe, then you see that we will suffer three to five months under droughts. Three to five months under drought every year in Europe. And this has a lot of implica uh, implica uh, implications for agriculture, for river flows, but also for forests. Now, I mentioned that already, there's a lot of uncertainty still in these models. And so therefore, we also work a lot on bringing data uh, from observations uh, to our models. And if you consider droughts and dry soils, the best what you can do is measure soil moisture. Now, usually soil moisture is only a very tiny measurement um, and it's, it's very small scale and it never can cover uh, big areas. But there's a method called cosmic sensing. And this method works like the follows. So you make use of cosmic nutrients, and these cosmic nutrients interact with the water in the soil, and uh, then these particles are detected in, uh, in detectors. It's a field measurement. It runs then together with a simulator, but in the end, it gives you an information on the regional soil moisture about some hundred meters. It's still only a single measurement, but we aim for more. We would like to have a national product on soil moisture. So the idea is now to take that sensor, to bring it to trains and to cars, and then run them through uh, Germany, combine it with our model data, and in the end to produce maps like that, a drought monitor for Germany that is validated with measured soil moisture. And we strongly believe that this product is of very much interest for different economic sectors. And why do we think that? So remember, drought means a strong decrease in soil moisture. And this is, has indirect implica uh, implications. So you need more water, for example, from groundwater. Uh, uh, you, you have an impact on transport uh, on the rivers. You have reduced cooling capacities, land uses changing. You have more losses and yields. We have heard that just in the presentation before. So you need to irrigate eventually. Um, fire risks are increasing. Uh, pest investigations are increasing and carbon balances uh, might be impacted. So this is a very huge task of, um, of research that we have to be, that has to be done here. And this is not what I can do by myself. And luckily the Helmholtz Association uh, initiated a climate initiative. We have heard that already in the talk of Gali um, Daniela Jakob. And this whole initiative will investigate it exactly effects like that. So I would like to come back uh, to this last point, the carbon cycle, because this is where we also do research uh, at the U of Z. So uh, forests cover around 30% of our land, and they play a very important role in the carbon uh, cycle because usually they act as a carbon sink. But this function is impacted by droughts, and if we go to 2003 again, then productivity was reduced, but more important, this sink uh, switched to a source. And the same happened in the Yemethan 2005 and 2010. So here also we need models uh, 
to look how this function will eventually change in the future. And we at the UFZ, or more particular Andrea Sud and his group, he is developing a forest simulator. And we took this forest simulator together and we implemented again our parameterization method in the simulator. Then we took a lot of data of uh, forest inventories and then came the essential step. We could uh, again link regional information, in this case remote sensing information, to these local properties and we could again regionalize the model. And then we could simulate 400 billion trees at the same time for the whole Amazon. And this was the very first time that a mechanistic model could produce results like that. So this is a map of biomass at the Amazon. So this we achieved already. And what we will do definitely in the future, we will make use of that model and we will simulate forests and carbon balances on continental scales and will exactly explore this question, do stay, do stay forests as a sink or not? Going back to Germany, we will also make use of the model in order to develop different management options and to explore the question, which are, which are the species compositions of trees, which are the most stable or resilient one under climate change conditions. Now, coming to my last slide. I hope that I convinced you that this method, this particular method uh, of parameterization, uh, brings or enables us uh, to make a seamless connection between global regional climate models and the impact models. I showed that for hydrology and forests already. And then focusing on specific areas, I think it's a prerequisite for courses of action. And I also think they will provide the basis for further socioeconomic analysis. And lastly, I'm really happy that we, with our research, can contribute uh, to this huge task to find the best responses to the challenge of global change. Thank you.